Carol Williams and I'm chair of the committee for the BC Liberal Seniors Commission and I'd like to welcome you all today. Thank you very much for attending and I was quite overwhelmed at the response. So it's obviously an indication that people are wanting information about seniors. So, um, and thank you to our terrific panel here and to the prof professionals who are providing information at the tables around. Uh, if you would like any information about any future town halls, then please do let me know. And uh, don't be alarmed, there are, uh, I think, a Saanich police officer here or two. They're not here to control the riot. <laughs> they are part of the uh, community education division. And um, uh, I think that's probably it. I will now uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Tony Heemskirk, who is our moderator for this afternoon. Uh, thanks, Carol. I'm very pleased to uh, introduce the speakers for the town hall and uh, to uh, help you to ask your questions uh, once we've had uh, the speeches. Uh, each, each speaker will have about 10 minutes, but I've already ho heard that uh, one of them might be going just a little bit longer. Um, I had an order of speakers arranged, but the speakers have already changed that on me. So uh, the order will be uh, what exists. Uh, Ken will start with that. Um, how we're doing. Isabel will speak to that. And then what we are doing uh, will be by Lori. So to give you a little background on each of the speakers, uh, Ken Hardy is a member of Parliament for Fleetwood Port Kells. He's a broadcaster and a senior public affairs manager. Ken Hardy has spent his career connecting people with information, resources, and services to better inform and engage people in their communities. Ken began his career in broadcasting as a commentator, announcer, and interviewer with various radio and television affiliates across BC in Western Canada, and as a freelance print media reporter. As a communications director in the public sector at both the Insurance Corporation of British Columbia and TransLink, he has been closely involved with key public safety and regional development initiatives across BC and in Metro Vancouver, including <coughs> Surrey. Isabel McKenzie is BC's first seniors advocate. The Office of the Seniors Advocate monitors and analyzes senior services and issues in BC and makes recommendations to government and service providers to address systematic issues. The OAS was established in 2014 and is the first office of its kind in Canada. Isabel McKenzie has over 20 years experience working with seniors in home care, licensed care, community service, and volunteer services. Isabel led BC's largest not-for-profit agency, serving over 6,000 seniors annually. Isabel led the implementation of a new model of dementia care and led the first safety accreditation for home care workers among many other accomplishments. Isabel has been widely recognized for her work and was named BC CEO of the Year for the nonprofit sector and nominated as a provincial health care hero. <laughs> uh, Lori McLeod is the executive director of the Elder Care Foundation. Uh, she has been executive director of the foundation since 2000. Lori was previously with Czech Television as director of community relations for 10 years, as well as an owner operator of Elk Lake Sports. Lori has been a dedicated community volunteer for over 25 years and has served on numerous boards and committees. Currently, Lori volunteers on the board of advisors for the University of Victoria's Institute on Aging and Lifelong Health, is past president of the Rotary, Rotary Club of Oak Bay, a member of the Oceanside Healthy Living Association, and serves on the Seniors Serving Seniors Directory Committee. Lori is an active member of both the Association of Fundraising Professionals 
and the Association of Gift Planners. Whew. <laughs> Some very qualified speakers. So now I'd like to uh, turn it over to Ken Hardy. First of all, it's not what you think. I'm actually 27, <laughs> but I've been sitting in question period for two years. I wanted to give you an overview of, uh, of what the federal government is doing and what we're thinking about because the, you know, what we're doing right now and what we're thinking about hopefully is all intended to lead us in the right direction. But that's what I need to hear back from you. So I'm going to be doing a lot more listening than actual talking today. But I wanted to give you a, a sense as to what the federal government is up to. The health, finance, families, children and social development, infrastructure, all those, all those ministries have something to do with assistance and programs for seniors in Canada. On top of that, there's standing committees made up of members of parliament from the government and from the opposition go through the details of proposed legislation or they go through the details of issues that they choose to study. The, uh, the various committees actually have a lot of freedom to pick up a, an item and study it to find out what's going on and make recommendations to government. Certainly with uh, respect to the party that I belong to, we also have commissions. We have four commissions, the Indigenous Commission, the Youth Commission, um, what's the other, Women's Commission and the Seniors Commission. And we have people here today like uh, Judy Higginbotham from actually my area out in Surrey Way uh, who's been very, very involved and others too, Carol uh, notably as well, with the, uh, the Liberal uh, Seniors Commission. And they are quite instrumental in bringing forward policy resolutions for the party to consider. They'll be working on some right now and they'll be something that we'll discuss in April when the party has its national convention in Halifax. We also have a seniors caucus in Ottawa. These, this is a group of members of parliament who get together and focus on seniors issues. They also do a lot of listening as well. They've been doing consultations across the country and if we look at the issues, here's what they've heard. First and foremost, access to affordable housing. Financial security. This all sounding familiar? Okay, access to health care and wellness programs. And the whole issue of social isolation, ageism, senior abuse, the things that happen and can happen, especially when couples are no longer couples for a variety of reasons and people find themselves isolated. I remember when I worked up in, in Kamloops at uh, a radio station there, we had a tremendous issue with older Italian ladies. They'd come over with their families when their husbands started working at the pulp mill that was being built in Kamloops. And the husbands passed away, the kids moved, moved away, and we had this group of senior ladies who had very little English because they all spoke Italian in the home. And the isolation there was really considerable, and this was a long time ago now. So here's, you know, the, the handout that I've left on the chairs goes through, goes through the um, government programs so far, but I'm going to list them quickly for purposes of the, the television folk. We have a national housing program. Uh, Minister Duclos will be making some announcements quite shortly as to what that looks like. But there's a considerable amount of money, uh, over $5 billion uh, in 11 years, with the target being low-income people and seniors. We want to, and we are, providing better access to home care. It's been an agenda item for the federal government. We provided funding to the provinces, but we did something a little unusual this time. Usually federal funding comes down and the provinces make their choices as to what they're going to do with it. This time there were strings attached. We said the money has to be used in, in actually for two programs. One was for mental health and the other was for, for home care. Uh, we have allocated $6 billion over 10 years for that. We have improved the Canada Caregiver Tax Credit and there's new unemployment or employment insurance benefits available for caregivers. So these are people who want to take time off work and care for somebody, including seniors, who need that kind of care. There's financial help for seniors most in need. And I know that becomes difficult because when you give, say, a, a certain set amount, a person can maybe do really, really well in a place like Grand Prairie, 
but it's more of a challenge in a place like Victoria or Metro Vancouver. But what we have done is uh, top up the guaranteed income supplement, so that's up to about $950 a year. We've dropped the age of eligibility for the old age supplement and the guaranteed income supplement. We've restored that to 65 years of age. The previous government had put it up a couple of years. We dialed it back to where it was before. But there's some additional aspects that uh, also go into the thinking around seniors' issues. There is the coordination with the provinces, especially on health care and housing, because health care is a provincial jurisdiction. So we work with them. Housing, similarly, I understand that the BC government uh, may be making some of their own announcements on housing fairly soon. Certainly the federal government will. A lot of the work that we have been doing has been around efforts to lowering costs for seniors because our experience and the experience of Mr. Harper's government before that is that quite often when you just put extra money out there, things like rents and everything else go up and nobody ends up further ahead. So there are some, if you like, foundational issues that we have to tackle. Housing, simply more supply is needed and I'm sure that uh, that's what we can expect from the federal housing uh, policy as well as the provincial one. Prescription medications. We've instituted a national bulk buying program with the provinces and territories. Again, you buy in bulk, you get a better price. We also include prescription uh, or, or pharmaceuticals in our discussions with uh, other countries around free trade and tariffs. Because again, what you want to be able to do is allow these, these therapies and, and medicines into the country at a lower cost. And there's always a bit of a tug of war, of course, with the pharmaceutical companies who want to maintain their proprietary control over something versus uh, governments who like to see them come in more into the public domain and obviously then to lower the costs. One of the resolutions coming forward to that convention I mentioned coming up in April is a national pharmacare program. Uh, one of our MPs has done a lot of work on that and he figures, in fact, that we can have a net saving countrywide with a national program as opposed to the patchwork quilt of private and, and, and public programs that are out there right now. We're also uh, revising the patent medicine regulations. Again, it goes back to the proprietary control that some companies want to keep over medicines for extended period of time. But we want to have a look at those regulations to see what we can do again to get those prices lower. And we're putting about $140 million over the next five years. We want to improve access to pharmaceuticals and we want to encourage innovation. I innovation in terms, in, in some cases, uh, through uh, the prescription process, the opioid price, uh, crisis that we're facing here in British Columbia especially, but trickling across the country, is in part to perhaps a very poor strategy for prescribing opioids for pain control. We need to have a look at that. But in addition, we need innovations obviously to make medicines work better and to make sure that people are getting the ones that they need. I want to mention another piece of this uh, which is important to me personally and, and I think to a lot of folks and that's service to veterans. We discovered after a new plan came in in 2005, a new charter for veterans, that the thinking to that point had been all about our veterans from World War II, and there were still a few left from World War I. So they changed it away from a lifetime uh, pension, and they started offering lump sums, which was okay for some of the vets, but certainly not for all, and certainly not for the new generation of veterans that are serving or have been serving now and are back home, and, and some of them are in pretty tough shape. So we're, we're going through that, we're, we're revising it. We reopened eight centers that had been closed by the previous government, added an, another one in Surrey. We're restoring staff. Again, there had been some significant staff cuts and we're in the process of hiring another 400 caseworkers right now. And we are revisiting the Veterans Charter and I, I understand that there will be announcement before the end of the year as a return to lifetime pensions for vets will be back on the table. Uh, let's see, public transit. My background partially at TransLink taught me a few things and I understand that there's some municipal councillors or ex-municipal councillors in the room. Um, 
it's important. It's important to seniors because that's mobility for many of them, especially if they can no longer drive or they don't like to drive at certain times of the day. So in the first wave of infrastructure funding for transit, we allocated $160 million to BC Transit, mostly for what we call state of good repair, keep things in good shape, and also to improve their existing services. But there's an additional $500 million, half a billion dollars, coming to BC Transit to support new projects. One of the two committees I sit on is the Transportation Infrastructure and Communities Committee. And we talk to Minister Garneau and Minister Sohi about their programs and, and their plans. And when it comes to transit, my background at TransLink actually is kind of useful because one of the things that I've been pushing for when I speak to those two ministers, as well as Minister Duclos on the housing side, is to ensure that the planning is right. You can spend a lot of money on transit and not help anybody. And in fact, if you look especially at a national housing policy, if we're going to be building affordable housing for seniors, it has to be near transit. Has to be. And the transit investments have to be balanced between conventional service and the introduction of low floor buses that are more accessible and the custom transit. I don't know if we call it, you call it handy dart on this side? You do, okay. Back 10 years ago, it concerned me a lot when I was at TransLink that every day, every last handy da dart bus available in Richmond was totally consumed taking people to dialysis. So people who had to go to work or had to go to school, etc., had to wait. And so we want to make sure that if we're putting money into transit, some of it is going to go to that kind of service. Uh, one of the things that we are going to do as a government to assist in the housing program is to make federal land, surplus federal land, available to municipalities to build things on. But there again, if the federal land is off in the boonies somewhere, that's not where you want to build your affordable housing. So there'll be some land swaps, I'm sure, to make sure that what is built is close to the services that people need. Okay. Immigration. That's one you might not think about, but I, I believe Isabel will actually reflect in part on that, and maybe Lori as well. The statistic that concerns us that arose out of the long-form census, which we returned because we needed better data than, than we had delivered, is that, uh, you know, we're, we're an aging society, and if nothing changes to bring more people in to actually do the work, within 20-odd years, we're only going to have two working people for every, every senior, and that's not sustainable. We need lots of young people out there working, contributing to the economy, and paying taxes to make sure that the services seniors need are going to be delivered. So that's really kind of the, you know, the, the main things that, that government is up to. I've gone over a lot of stuff on a very high level. And if you have questions based on the handout, by all means. But the three questions I'd like you to think about, what are your top concerns? Because if I haven't mentioned them, tell me, and I'll write them down and take them back. What services from the federal government need to be improved, or how can we work better with the provincial and municipal governments? And let's face it, how much should we do for seniors is like asking how long is a piece of string and how high is up. So what are the priorities? Things to think about, and I hope to hear from you. Thank you very much. I just wanted to remind you that um, after all the speakers, you'll have an opportunity for uh, questions, so you can write them down and think about them uh, for uh, the question period. So our next speaker is Isabel McKenzie. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I see lots of faces in the audience that I recognize. I was out this morning on the Saanich Peninsula and saw lots of faces out there I recognized as well. So I'm going to give you a little food for thought, a little bit of context uh, for you to digest and think of some of your questions and thoughts and uh, plans for seniors uh, that uh, uh, hopefully you'll be challenged on as we continue through this afternoon. So my friend Lori here is going to be my uh, slide uh, mover along. So first slide. The question I often get asked are who are seniors and what do they want? And then of course the politicians will usually follow up with and how can I get them off my back? And 
I say, well, that is a very easy question to ask, but it is a very difficult question to answer. Because you might just as well ask, who are people and what do they want? So the differences in experiences, in hopes, in dreams, in aspirations, in sense of what wants to be achieved out of life is as different amongst people over the age of 65 as it is amongst people at the age of 20, 30, 40, 50, uh, and so on. And to illustrate this, I talk about two women 60 years ago named Jane and Anne. So some of you will be Jane. All of you will know a Jane. Jane was the person who did everything perfectly all of the time. So Jane always had the homework done, the pencils were uniformly sharpened to the same length, the sandwich was neatly wrapped in wax paper, she graduated high school, she got married, she had children, dinner was on the table every night, she joined the junior league, she played bridge, she played tennis, you get the idea. At every one of life's transition points, Jane did exactly what society thought Jane should be doing at that transition point. And life generally te te treat treats people like Jane, the conformists of the world, very well. But born in the same era at the same time was Anne, or Annie, the hippie chick, the iconoclast, the I'm not going to live up to anyone's preconceived thoughts of what I should do or who I should be. I'm going to go out and explore the world and backpack through Nepal and uh, go to Woodstock and be a free spirit. Not the pearls and sweater set for me, it's the free flowing locks and the macrame bikinis. And at the age of 30, Jane and Anne are very clearly different women. They look different. They're able to express their individuality, not frustrated by any physical restrictions. And so they're chalk and cheese. We wouldn't for one minute think that Jane and Anne want to read the same book, watch the same movie, eat the same food, go on the same vacation, live in the same place. But something happened 60 years later. Next slide. Jane and Anne became seniors. Now they're 90. So they must want to read the same books, watch the same television shows, eat the same food. Let's make them roommates. They'll have so much in common <laughs> because they're seniors. We put a label on them. And we joke. But the reality is, when we put a label on a group of people based on one defining characteristic, in this case, age, it's no different than we take a group of people with a defining characteristic of their religion, their culture, their gender, their socioeconomic status, their, social, their sexual preferences. When we ascribe to everybody with that one characteristic a whole host of characteristics, we create stereotypes. And when we create these stereotypes, we create systemic discrimination. And that is what is happening to many of our seniors, both in British Columbia and arguably in Canada, is that we are treating seniors as this homogeneous group with this label on it. And they're a problem to be solved. They're the health care crisis that is facing us this group of people. And in fact, when you look at the information, when you look at the, the facts of the matter is, a matter, a very different picture emerges. So let's go to the next slide. And your eyes are going to glaze over the, uh, some of these numbers. I hope some of you can read them. But let's first of all talk about this tsunami. And Ken talked a little bit about, uh, about the numbers. But to put it in perspective, Today in British Columbia, 18% of our population is over the age of 65, and that is going to shift to be 24% of our population by 2031, and at that point, it is going to stabilize. And so in terms of the age pyramid, it's going to balance out at about 24% over the age of 65 and 76% under the age of 65. So 
you can have your own impressions about whether the shift from 18% to 24% is as tectonic and dramatic as the term tsunami would imply. But to give you some sense of perspective, whether you got 17% on your math exam or 24% on your math exam, you still got an F. Didn't shift the letter grade, right? And we've known that this has been coming for 45 years. We have been projecting, and I think we have been planning. And before we think our sky fall has fallen and our world has ended and the whole economy of British Columbia is going to be supported by two guys in a sawmill in Quesnel working 12-hour shifts, we should look around the globe and realize that countries like Japan, Italy, some of the Nordic nations are already at or close to <coughs> a quarter of their population age 65 and over, and their world has not ended. Even some of our developing countries in South America have a far higher percentage of their population over age 65 than we do. So maybe we can think about whether the term uh, and the drama that it implies of tsunami is the right description for our senior population. The other stereotype that is out there is that all of our seniors have gobs of money and if we could only liberate them from their wallets, we would solve all of our public spending problems. Well, interestingly enough, according to the tax filer data, people over the age of 65 have the lowest median income of any age cohort over 25 by actually quite a significant amount when you start looking at the cohort of 40 to 55, which is the prime income earning years. 50% of British Columbia seniors live on an income of less than $26,000 a year. 50%. And when you look at homeowners, 24%, a full quarter of our homeowners have a household income of less than $30,000. So they may have, if they live in the Lower Mainland and in Victoria, significant equity in their home. But that equity, we have to find a way for it to produce the income that is going to allow them to pay for the roof repair and the deck that falls off the back of the house. Because they don't have an income to support the value of asset that they have. Renters have an even tougher time because they don't have any house equity. And about 20% of people over the age 65 in this province are renters. And if they're in the Lower Mainland or in Victoria, they've got a particular problem. They are disproportionately poorer. Mm -hmm. So you've got 35%, 60,000 souls out there renting and living on a household income under $20,000 a year. They've got to find the rent out of that and a whole bunch of other things. So 60,000 people out there. The other stereotype that's out there that we need to uh, have a look at what the real picture is as we plan for the future is this notion that uh, live long enough, you're going to end up in the old home, folks' home, right? You're going to head for the nursing home. The reality is 94%, 93% of people over the age of 65 in this province live completely independently. Now 65 is the new whatever, 30. So I looked at age 85, which is the average age of a person in a nursing home in this province. At age 85 and older, 85 and older, three quarters, 75% of people live completely independently. 10% live in retirement or assisted living, and 15% live in a nursing home. The statistical reality for the vast, vast majority of you in this room is that you will live your entire lives in your own home. You will not go to a nursing home. Publicly subsidized home support. So again, you know, it's about the same. It's um, only 4% of people over 65 use it. So we look at 85, which is a little bit above the um, average age, and we find only 13% use it. So when you look at 13% in publicly subsidized residential care, 13% uh, on publicly subsidized home support. What you realize is this notion of these dependent seniors sucking at the public trough is not actually what's happening at all. 
70% of people over 85 are living on their own and their own dime. So they may need help but they're paying for it themselves. And even when they go into residential care, we take 80% of their income in this province. And when we give them home support, we charge them a co-payment if they're uh, not on the guaranteed income supplement. And it's not an insignificant. Somebody on $25,000 a year income is going to pay $5,300 a year for daily home support. So if they're also paying rent, it's a problem. The emergency department. So the other image uh, is that, you know, little Jimmy went in with a broken arm and had to wait four days because the hallways were chock-a-block with grandma being rehydrated. And we just have to do something about this problem of seniors clogging up the emergency department. Well, you know, funny thing, 21% of people in the emergency department are age 65 and over. Now, they are 18% of the population, so it is more uh, than the exact percentage of the population. But the vast majority of people who use the emergency department in this province and in Canada are kids not seniors. So to think that there's this problem in our emergency departments that needs to be solved is actually not really addressing uh, some of the more systemic issues. Uh, average life expectancy. As you know, uh, BC has, one of, has the highest life expectancy of any provinces, and we're much higher than other countries like Britain, uh, Sweden, uh, many of the European countries, we have higher life expectancy. But what's important is when you're 65, average life expectancy, 20 years. When you're 85, seven years. When you're 90, it's five years. When you're 95, it's three years. When you're 100, your life expectancy is still two years. Now you are about 105 before we're expressing your life expectancy in months, and we're never expressing it in brackets. <laughs> and so the important message is, no matter what age you are, there's years of life left. And we need to remember that when we're making decisions for ourselves and when we in the system are making decisions for other people. So before we write off the 80-year-old who comes into the emergency department for some kind of surgery repair, let's think about how many years of life this person might have left. It's actually a lot more than some of us realize. Living in an urban area, 65% of seniors live in an urban area. There's no doubt uh, it is better to age in an urban area, and there is no doubt that Victoria is the best place in the province. I would not have said that before I had this job. Because my entire professional career was in Victoria, and all you see is what you don't have. It's not until you get out to other communities in British Columbia and see what others don't have that we have here that you come to appreciate the strength of this community. I think part of it might be its size, part of it might be its geography that we're closed in on three uh, sides by water. I'm not quite sure what it is. It's the origin of the QRT program 30 years ago in Victoria that built up community resources. But without a doubt, um, while we have challenges here as elsewhere, Victoria is one of the best places to be a senior. Seniors living without a diagnosis of dementia. So here's the other notion that's out there. Live long enough and you're going you're gonna to be dotty. You're going to lose your marbles, right? Just all these people are going to be wandering around the streets going, who am I, where am I? And, you know, the power of numbers. There's a book out right now uh, by Michael Lewis who wrote Moneyball, and he's got a new one out called The Undoing Project, and it's detailing the work of two Israeli psychologists on the power of numbers. And how we choose to express things will feed into our perceptions and our stereotypes. So they give as an example, when you say to a patient, you have a 90% chance of surviving this surgery, or you say to a patient, you have a 10% chance of not surviving this surgery, many, many, many more people will choose the surgery when it is expressed as 90% chance of survival than 10% chance of not surviving. And yet it's the same odds. It's how you choose to express them. Right? So when we talk about dementia, one way to express it is 20% of people over 85 have dementia. So one out of five people over 85 have dementia. However, what that means is 80% don't. Four out of five don't. Over 85. So just like the overwhelming odds are that most people will live in their own homes all of their life, 
Most people will maintain all of their marbles, however many or few they may be, all of their life. And so you need to think about that when you see somebody with gray hair, you know, struggling at the pin pad at Safeway and you roll your eyes behind them, and we know you're rolling your eyes behind them, and you're thinking that, oh, you know, they've got dementia. Actually, statistically, the odds are it's something else. It's macular degeneration, it's arthritis, it's one of eight different pin numbers they're memorizing because they follow the rule, don't use the same one all the time. I use the same one, right? Because they do what they're told. <laughs> It's least likely, statistically, to be dementia. And yet, let's be honest about what we, the conclusion we all jump to as part of our stereotyping. Uh, driver's license, Ken was talking about transportation. The reality is that uh, most of us, if we live past 85, will lose our driver's license. So at the age of 65, 75% uh, of people are driving, and that drops to 34% at age 85. And as you can see from all the other statistics. You're still active, alert, engaged, want to get out. You can still play bridge, play golf, come to this meeting. You can still do all of that. You just can't drive. And so we are going to have to deal with that. And I think my time is up. Um, so then you can also see uh, the other two points I want to make are employed and volunteering. So the other shift that's happening, and Ken talked about this in the uh, age for accessing OAS, and it is a public policy issue we need to think about. Because the reality is we are working uh, late to later in life than we did. The percentage of people working past the age of 65 has increased 54% in the last 10 years. And one of the triggers that happened 10 years ago was the policy decision to allow people to defer conversion of RSPs to RIFs to age 71 from age 69. So public policy decisions we make around incentivizing behavior actually do materialize in how people behave. And so we want to be very careful that we don't incentivize people to not work versus uh, to work when they are able to do so and can contribute, continue to contribute to the, uh, to the society and to the economy. So that's just a little bit of background information for you to process some of um, your thoughts through in terms of what we might be doing for the future in terms of supporting seniors. So thank you very much. Thank you, Isabel. So our next uh, speaker is uh, Laurie McLeod. So as introduced, my name is Laurie McLeod, and I'm the Executive Director for the Elder Care Foundation. And for those of you who don't know about the foundation, we are a registered charity, and we were founded in 1982. We raise and manage funds dedicated to supporting the provision of an enhanced quality of life for elders. And in Greater Victoria, we directly support residents in six extended care facilities, as well as supporting community programs to help people remain in their own homes longer. Our mission, in partnership with our donors, is to ensure that communities support and embrace aging with respect and dignity. And with our partners and collaborative approach, we're growing our provincial scope to ensure that British Columbia residents have access to the resources and supports that they need to age in place. Our elders are our knowledge and record keepers. They pioneered and shaped the world that we live in today, and they are now pioneering the fundamental shift towards positive aging. And we've all heard the stats around the population in Canada. For the first time ever, we have more people over the age of 65 than we do people under the age of 15. And as we just heard from uh, both speakers, this is often framed in a negative way. And we need to shift that perception. We heard that seniors are referred to as the silver tsunami. And to me, that just conjures up a natural disaster ready to suck up all our health care resources. And we need to change that because, in fact, seniors are not an overall drain on society. They are assets. They share knowledge. They share talents. They should be celebrated and recognized for their positive, contribu positive contributions. And I think I heard in another presentation that you made, Isabel, that in BC, 65 million volunteer hours are attributed to people over the age of 65. Every year. Every year. That's a huge contribution. But volunteerism is changing. We have a shrinking volunteer pool. Volunteer commitments are changing too. 
organizations that rely on volunteers to fill those regular shifts on an ongoing basis for those fabulous programs that they run. They say it's becoming very challenging as new volunteers tend to look for those one-time or occasional opportunities that align with their busy schedules. So it's really hard to run a regular program that relies on volunteers if you can't count on those regular volunteers to fill all those shifts. The overwhelming majority of today's seniors are active and engaged. But we also know that as we transition through the lifespan, those transitions sometimes come with a loss. Loss of a driver's license may lead to loss of independence. Loss of health may mean that things that you used to love to do, you can no longer do anymore. Loss of a loved one or a spouse may lead to social isolation. And here's a stat that absolutely shocked me. Did you know that social isolation has a negative effect on your health equal to smoking 15 cigarettes a day? That just amazed me. So how can we, together, as a community, educate, empower, and engage people to be better prepared, better informed, and better connected so that they can more successfully navigate their own journey of aging? In 2006, the Elder Care Foundation launched its Embrace Aging initiative. And each year during the month of March, we shine the spotlight on the community's amazing seniors, their abilities, their accomplishments, and their contributions. Embrace Aging Month also shines a spotlight on the wealth of resources and educational opportunities that are actually available year-round in our communities to help people navigate their journey of aging. Embrace Aging Month encourages people to explore the possibilities and get connected. And the four pillars are be well, which is all of your health and well-being, be secure, which is your financial and your personal security, be connected, which is your personal, social network and your community network, and be enriched, arts, culture, spirituality, education. And research shows that incorporating all four of these pillars leads to a more positive aging journey and a better quality of life as we age. And I'm just going to tell you a little story. I got a phone call from a lady, and she said to me, I don't know what to do. My dad passed away about a year ago, and I'm really worried about my mom. She's not going out anymore. She doesn't seem to have a circle of friends anymore. And I'm kind of really worried about her. I'm, I'm thinking she might be kind of depressed, and I don't know what to do. Well, it just so happened that it was February. So I told this daughter, I said, well, March is Embrace Aging Month, and during Embrace Aging Month, there's lots of things that happen free in the community. And maybe you can take your mom out and see if you can get her connected to some things. There's a lifestyle expo where there's seniors groups and organizations that have volunteer opportunities. Uh, they do all kinds of things like dancing and singing. There's also resource and service providers there that, that have different offerings and our recreation centers. Everybody's there. But also, throughout the community, these resource and service providers, they open their doors and they explain what is available and there's free drop-in sessions. And at the Wellness Center on Hillside, there's over 30 free education sessions, everything from laughter yoga to how to have a good visit with your doctor. I said, how about if I send you a little schedule and maybe you can talk your mom into going to some of these things and, and maybe she'll find some new things that she's interested in. So I sent off the schedule, didn't think everything, anything about it. So fast forward a few months, and remember, I'm a fundraiser. So I get a phone call, and the person on the other end says, I'm mad at you. My heart sinks. No fundraiser ever wants anybody to be mad at them. And then there was laughter on the other end. And she said, oh, you probably don't remember me, but I called a few months back about my mom, because I was really worried, and you sent me all this information about Embrace Aging Month. And I took my mom, and I'm mad at you now, because she's so darn busy, she's never available to babysit my kids anymore. So then I knew that Embrace Aging Month was making a difference. The many BC not-for-profit groups and organizations that provide the valuable array of community-based senior services, activities, and educational opportunities are facing challenges too. Greater demand for their services, greater competition for funding, shrinking and changing volunteer pools. So I was very fortunate to be part of the Provincial Raising the Profile Project, which just held a provincial summit to lay the groundwork for a collaborative approach to strengthening this community-based senior services sector. 
and the support that it provides to BC seniors. The goal is to work together with all levels of government, the community-based senior services sector, funders, health authorities, academic institutions, communities, and people from all walks of life to ensure that all seniors in BC can age in place, no matter where they live or what their circumstances. So building on our Embrace Aging initiative and building on our involvement with the Raising the Profile project, Elder Care is working on a wellness navigation initiative in partnership with the BC Healthy Community Society and a number of others. It's called Elder Connect, and it's to help make it easier for communities and individuals and the community-based senior services sector to find and access resources, support, and services. We're currently developing our first Community Elder Connect pilot in Souk. The community hub consists of three parts. That's along the bottom there. So there'll be an online services directory with events and activities and everything that that particular community has to offer. And yes, it will be printable because we know that not everybody loves to use the online at this point, but we're building it for the future. And we know that people of the future will probably be online. There's also a community-based senior services committee. So all of those people that run all those services in that community can get together. They know what each other does so that if Mary is seeing one and they recognize that maybe they could use some other services, they know that those services are available. And they can also share what's going on so there aren't overlaps. So we know that the budgets are very small for those organizations, so it would be great if they didn't have events at the same time at the same place that cost money because they couldn't get all the people to attend. There's also going to be a citizens council and those will be our promoters, our wayfinders, our advisors and our online moderators. They'll be the people in the community that will help us make sure that all of these things work and are kept up to date. So the idea is to template this so that it can be replicated in communities across BC. Well actually across Canada for that matter. And all community hubs would have the same look, the same language, and the same wayfinding. So for instance, if you live in Souk and you know how to use the one in Souk, but your mom's in Dawson Creek and you're talking to mom and you're going, hey, I think mom needs to figure out some new things or needs some new support. Well, you can jump on Dawson Creeks because it's going to have the same look, language, and wayfinding, except it's going to be specific to that community. All the community hubs are going to be connected to the main Elder Connect online hub. That's where those provincial and federal and all of those other resources like family caregivers will all be. Ability 411, HealthLink BC, all of those, and probably many others. It, there will also be a knowledge hub for the community-based senior services sector so that they can share their expertise. And if there's a great program working in, in one place, it can be shared with another community so that they don't have to reinvent the wheel. More effective, more efficient. And there will be funding sustainability as well, because we can monetize that so that we can make sure that we're not always asking the government for money, that we can generate some funding for ourselves to be able to support those community hubs, support those organizations. It's a big idea with big potential and, of course, a big price tag. So I'm going to be out there pounding the pavements and looking for some funding to make this happen. So. If you're faced with change due to a life transition, socially, medically, financially, or otherwise, a reliable one-stop shop like Elder Connect could make it so much easier to find the support you need to age in place and find new ways to stay connected and find new things to engage in, making quality of life better. Because being connected and actively engaged keeps us young at heart. And I just want to leave you with one of my favorite sayings. Aging is mandatory. Growing old is not. Thank you. Well, I think you all agree we had some uh, wonderful information from our speakers. Now is the opportunity to ask some questions of our speakers. Seniors have become a default daycare provider. We're not all qualified and not all children have seniors to do it. Uh, we think, or at least I think in my family, and, and we have a grandchild that we care for, and we're hoping we're going to have more. But 
We also believe that we need a national daycare strategy. We need a daycare strategy that makes daycare affordable for my children uh, who make reasonable incomes but certainly would struggle to pay full-time daycare. Thank you. This is something we've heard. Uh, and uh, certainly it, it was, uh, in fact, uh, you might recall in the NDP platform in the last election that they wanted to bring in a, a national daycare program. They discovered, as I think all federal governments and provincial governments as well have discovered, with the exception of Quebec, that uh, it's an expensive proposition. So what would be useful, um, and maybe we can just have a quick show of hands based on your family experience, what, what, what is kind of the, the threshold amount on a per day cost that would be reasonable? Like $90 a day is really expensive. $15 a day isn't sustainable, and Quebec is finding that out. So what are we saying, under 30? Does that sound, you know, or more like under 25? Here's a show of hands here. So I'll, I'm just, I'm just going to go up and uh, I'm going to start at the top and, and work down. Throw your hand up when you think that it's, it's about the right number. So let's say $30 a day, 25 okay, 20 yeah, so 20 25 somewhere in there. Okay, I, I'll take that back. Uh, it is a discussion that we're having, but uh, uh, as... As any government will tell you, on a day-to-day -day basis, there's a lot of folks tugging at our sleeves looking for support. You know, we haven't talked about autism, and Lord, that's a huge one. Um, so, but we'll, we'll put that into the mix. Thanks. I'd like to raise mainly two issues. Um, housing, no problem there, right? And working. They say, oh, you know, the gray revolution, we're all gonna, we're all gonna have jobs. Try and get a job when you're over 65. I've had over 42 jobs I just added up. I got a lot of skills. I don't have the papers. Must have recent experience. I built my own house. I've prospected. I've, you name it, I've, I've done it. Uh, a baker. I don't have recent experience. And um, so, yeah, it's not easy to get a job when you're over 65. I'll be 68 next birthday. Um, housing. Again, uh, I see quite a bit for, for seniors, but what about seniors with dependents? Um, I don't know if, if anyone can speak to that, but when you look for a se seniors' residence, uh, you must be over, I think, 60, 55 or 60. What if one partner is younger than that? I have a two-year-old son. I'm, we're in a real quandary. So, yeah, I, know, I realize that's not a normal situation, but um, so I'm just, we need more, um, we need affordable housing. I think we all know that, and I think more co-ops. Co-ops are the way to go. Thank you. I'll talk to the housing issue uh, for seniors and what there is in the province. The housing issue for seniors is different than the housing issue and crisis that you hear about for the population at large. It's not about obtaining home ownership. It is, it is focused on the renters. We have in British Columbia the Shelter Aid for Elderly Renters, or SAFER program, which gives a rent subsidy. It's an entitlement program. It's available to anybody age 60 and over, and it's based on income. It's income tested. And so I think the top income might be about $27,000, and then they look at your rent and they give you a subsidy. Then there is senior, what we call seniors subsidized housing, which is a specific uh, building where the units are occupied by people aged 55 and over or um, a person with a disability. And recently, the definition of disability has expanded to include those with mental health and substance abuse issues. The waiting list for a subsidized housing, which is where you pay approximately 30% of your income, so whatever your income is, you would pay 30%. There are thresholds as well, and there is an asset test. Uh, people are generally waiting about two to three years for one of those spots. 
SAFER, the Shelter Aid for Elderly Renters, uh, is an entitlement. There is no waiting list. There is a processing period. The challenge is that the cap of rent that they will subsidize in Greater Victoria is $647 a month. So if you can find a place to rent for that, the subsidy is very good. But if your rent is above that, you pay 100% above it. But there, those are the main uh, programs that are available to help uh, seniors who are renters right now. One more thing on, on the housing side. Uh, the federal government dropped out of the housing uh, issue a long time ago. We're coming back in. Some of our initial, uh, initial investments are in co-ops to update them because some of them are in pretty dreadful shape. Uh, I was fortunate uh, in my riding, we just got about $350,000 to do some major renos on one of our fairly big co-ops. Uh, we recognize that the stock is old and it uh, really does need some care and attention. So that's where some of our initial infrastructure investments in housing are going. As far as the uh, employment side, uh, that is a tough one. That's again, that's one that I can take back because uh, just like volunteerism, this should be the golden age for people with a lot of experience to make those additional contributions. My former boss, uh, Claude Richmond, when he was a, a cabinet minister, was the one that did away with mandatory retirement at 65 and I think that there was a recognition at the time that just because you hit that magic point that somehow you're you're not able to contribute anymore but it's like the whole market uh, you know you have to have the match between the available position and the skills if we're dealing with this business of well no recent experience maybe that's something that uh, we need to have a closer look at maybe there's some bridging or something that could be done there because every time you turn around there's somebody with a job that they can't fill these days so you know something has to connect a little bit better there so i'm going to turn the mic back to carol well, thank you again, everybody, for being here. Please feel free to help yourselves to some refreshments here, to ask the panel any questions that you might have, and to visit the uh, tables. Thank you very much.